actually in real life be one of the female characters in any of the Hallmark movies you've watched. Yeah. And date date one of those men in one of those movies. <laughs> and be that character. Who would it be? What movie? I wonder who that would be. Eh? Yeah. Well, I want to welcome you to a very special episode of Media from the Heart. My name is Ruth Hill, and I'm your host. And this is Hang Out with Ruth Hill. Yes, I was in the hot seat. You will learn the answer to that question, that burning question, and many, many others. It meant so much to have so many of my friends come and support me during this time. Some of them I've met before and some of them I haven't. Without further ado, we're going to jump right into this episode. So please enjoy. I want to make this just a time for you guys to, you can ask me questions, we can hang out, maybe there's things you want to talk about. Coming from someone who never dreamed I would be doing um, anything like this, where I would be the one front, like out in front talking to people, I was always one who wanted to be in the background. That was always how I saw myself. And I didn't want to see myself up front. And so for years, I was doing doing these interviews where I would interview actors. Um, I mean, I don't know how many of you know my story necessarily. Um, But for many years, I was doing reviews and interviews and I would write them up and it and it usually did take several days to write these interviews up because writing was very very important to me to get it exactly right to sound for it to sound right and so I really thought that that's what I would continue doing that was my whole thought it's like okay I'm just going to keep doing this I'm going to keep interviewing people and I and it's um it's really interesting I was sometimes doing four interviews a day, and I'm not joking on that. I was like keeping myself in this insane schedule of because I had this idea of I had to do so many interviews. I had to just keep going, keep going. I could never say no. I had to keep doing it and doing it and doing it. And it was it was very time consuming. I loved writing the interviews and I loved getting to interview the actors, but I found that I was not always able to get them up in a timely fashion because I was so busy. It's been interesting then when the opportunity came along for me to work for Paul Green as an executive assistant, that what I wasn't sure if I was going to be able to keep doing these interviews. And so in many ways, I took a break from it. I kept my website because I always had the thought, what am I going to do with this website? And so for over a year, a year and a half or so, I haven't really been able to do the interviews like I had wanted to do them. And I was thinking about collaborating with others and trying to do that. And and, um, so what really spurred me on to do this podcast was two things. First of all, um, some of you probably know that Paul Green and his partner, Kate Austin, that they have a, a company. Um, Freedom Alchemist, and they do Freedom Portal, which is like a, a health mind body connection thing, um, and it's an online education coach coach type thing. And um, so, what I was doing is I was I've been taking these courses, and it helped me a lot. But I I joined what they called their master class. I was all about let me do everything for everyone else. You know, it's not about me, not about, it's always, it's always been about, let me serve everybody else. And I'm not worried about building anything for myself. That had been kind of my way of thinking. As I, as I went on um, in this course, it just so happens. And it's so nice to see everybody. I'm, I'm so happy to see you all here. As I was going on in the course, in this master class. Kate, who is Paul Green's partner, she said, well, Ruth, this is great that you're listing all these things that you want to do for Paul and for everybody else, but what do you want for yourself? And I'm going to be honest with all of you. 
I actually got upset when she asked she because she said you need to think of doing something for yourself. I'm like, well, I'm doing plenty of things and and they do bring me joy. I was really upset. Um, I was actually I actually got so upset I started crying about it. As a matter of fact, I did not want to have to come up with stuff for me. I was thinking I'm doing stuff for Paul. I'm doing stuff here. I'm doing stuff here. I'm doing stuff here. I don't, and, and I'm enjoying it, so why do I need to come up with anything for me? But as a result of her saying that, it started me to thinking, and I thought, okay, I'm going to collaborate with somebody, and we'll get a podcast going. And so I reached out to one of my friends, and we had a meeting, and we had a couple meetings, and that was going to go ahead. And what happened was that didn't quite work out. She was off, my friend was off doing other things. She was she was getting to appear in Hallmark movies and go to Hallmark movie sets. And then uh, my, and my friend is Jax. And, and in fact, there's a, there's an episode where Jax and I kind of talked about, and I was mentioning when we might collaborate and that had kind of been what I thought would happen. And so what spurred me on was um, some of you might know that Paul Green has a podcast called the grass is greener with Paul Green. And it and his Christmas movie, Christmas CEO, he brought on a lot of people for his podcast. And he decided, why don't I try and bring on a virtual audience? And I thought, oh, that sounds like a really great idea. So I so I watched what he did with them and I started thinking, okay, I could have a podcast where I'm interviewing people and I can bring on a virtual audience. And I can just open it up to everybody. And, and I wasn't even sure how I was going to do it at first. I what, didn't even have a Facebook group. I didn't, I mean, this has all been a process and it's all been jumping in and just trying things. And so that's how my podcast came about. I, I wanted to be able to interview people. And the really cool thing I love about this, I love having a virtual audience. I love that now I can bring on a wide variety of people and we can have a very, it's not just Hallmark, but we've got actors and we've got writers and authors. And there's even a woman that I'm talking to right now that we're going to get a podcast up and she's the CEO of a travel company. There's lots of different things that we're going to be doing. A lot of, um, there's, I'm reading a book right now called Essentialism, and uh, I also have another Facebook group where it kind of sat there for a while, and I'm bringing it back, and we're reading books, and we're going to have a book talk, and that's going to be part of my podcast, and that's going to happen at the at the end of February. And actually, my mom and I were just talking about, you might not know this, but my mom teaches um, a Bible study class. And she's thinking about what she's going to do after her current study is done. And it's all done by Zoom. And I'm going to actually jump in and and have some segments that I'm going to do, some short segments to go along with her Bible study and release that as podcast episode too. So I love the fact that my podcast can be super eclectic and that it involves so many. I mean, you guys, it's, it, I mean, it's so great to see so many people coming on and being a part of the audience. And so that's kind of how things have come to this point is it's just, it's just been jumping in, trying things. And every time I turn around, I mean, like uh, last Thursday, my backdrop was all over the place. I mean, I, I was starting to watch it back and it, it kept moving. I did a better job of getting it in place. And every time I want it to build, I've, I've got a microphone that I've got to set up and start using. There's all these different things. And every time I want to keep getting better and better and better. And you guys are a huge part of that. All of you who come, I, I mean, most, most of you have been coming to these regularly and it's so great to see you. you. You've all been so supportive. I can't believe how many people have joined in with the Facebook group and how many downloads there have been of the podcast. It's just kind of like blowing my mind because I had no idea what I was doing and I just am jumping in and learning. So that's kind of my story. And what I wanted to be able to do is maybe you all would like to... Is there something you want to talk about? Is there something that you would like to ask me? And maybe you guys have things that you would like to see 
um, other topics, other ideas for podcasts. I, and I would love that. I would love to hear from you all. Um, so, would anybody like to ask me anything? I got a list. I got a I list. Oh, you have a list. <laughs> Ooh, I'd love to hear your list. Uh, well, I want to go back to the beginning where you were talking about when you were writing. Did you work for a company or how did you come up with just start writing? That's a really good question. Thank you for asking. Well, writing for me has been something that I've been doing since I was in the fourth grade. I had a teacher that really inspired me and I started writing. And in fact, I have a an unpublished book. I don't plan to ever publish it because if I go back and read it now, it, it was written as a teenage, I was a teenager when I wrote it. And it's great. It's fun to go back and look at, but I, but, but it's like a 350 page book that I, that I wrote and, and I loved it and I planned to publish it. It didn't quite work out. Um, but uh, writing English for me is always, I mean, I love music and that's what I majored in in college is I did major in music. The, the writing uh, for me, um, it just is something I did, something I was good at, something I really enjoyed. Um, I would take courses. Uh, actually, when I was in college, one of my favorite stories to tell is I was in college studying music, and I asked if I could take this English course as a substitution for the regular English course that I was supposed to take. And they said, well, only English majors are taking this. You can take it if you want to, but you're going to be with other English majors and you're not an English major. I'm like, that's okay. And I had the highest score in the class by the time it was done because wow. I absolutely love English. I love writing. And it's been something that I've been able to excel at for most of my life. I moved back here to Washington State to live with my parents. And I was unable to get those teaching jobs. And so I was a sub for many, many years. And during that time, I started to see people writing blogs and that was like all the rage. I was following blogs and I kept thinking to myself, could I ever do something like that? All these people are writing blogs and they're getting to review things for companies. And I, I thought, well, I don't know if I want to jump in and do it. But then one day I just thought, you know, I'm going to do it. I, I'm only subbing. I have all this extra time on my hands. Let me just jump in and try it just to see if I could do it. And so I just started, right. I just started doing these blogs. I started, I, I mean, I started a website. I had no idea what I was doing. Really. I didn't. I just kept asking and researching and jumping in and doing it and trying things. And I had quite a blog going. I was getting stuff from companies and beginning to review it. I was a mommy blogger. I was following the trend. That's what everybody was doing. They were mommy bloggers. And then I got burned out from doing all these reviews because it wasn't really what I love. So then when I started watching Hallmark, that was actually when I started changing. I thought, okay, I've got this blog over here and I need to inject some more interest and excitement in it. So why don't I review movies? And, and that was what got me into the Hallmark world was I was reviewing movies, reviewing TV shows. And so I did that for quite a while. And then that led to me interviewing actors. And so I didn't actually work for a company. It was just okay. me jumping in and saying, I love writing let's give this a chance. Let's just try it out. But that, that's, that's a good question. And I, and I'm glad you asked. So I hope did that answer your question. Yeah. Yeah, it did. Good. Do, do, you, do you, someone else can ask a question, but do you have, cause you're so busy. Mm -hmm. Do you have a daily routine that you try to keep to? That's another great question. Cause yes, I actually do. So a couple of years ago, I didn't a couple of years ago, quite honestly, I would get up in the morning, have my coffee, have my breakfast, and I would sit and watch the news. If I didn't have to work that day, I would literally sit on my phone 
watching the news for three hours. And I'm not even joking. I mean, that was really bad. It sounds really bad when I list, when I listen to it now. I would exercise in the afternoon, uh, the afternoon, evening. I started doing that when, when my daughter was a baby and I needed to have, needed to figure out when I could exercise. I could only exercise after she went to bed because I was a single mother and it was the only way that I could make it work. Now I do have a morning routine. Um, I, I began to implement that as actually as a matter of by going through these courses that I mentioned, um, that's, that's how I started doing it is so my morning routine is typically I'm up by six o'clock do when I first get up, I actually do spend some time, which I, which I know some people would not agree with this, but it's what works for me. I do spend some time quickly going through my emails, not where I get caught up in stuff, Really, really what I do is I go through and delete a bunch of emails because I get hundreds of emails a day. And so it gives me a chance most of the time I'm going through and deleting the stuff so that when I come to it later to answer questions and to respond to get, and to do all my work stuff, um, I want to have those emails that aren't important. I want them gone. So for me, it works really, really well to take that time and just go through those emails and see what my day is going to look like. And then after that, I go out and I spend a half an hour on our rebounder. Um, that's a mini trampoline. And I come back in, have my celery juice. I usually, depending on, unless something comes up that I'd, I need to set aside, I do try to do another half hour of a workout. Um, usually it's a YouTube video so that I'm doing strength training or, or something else to really challenge my body because I, because I need that. Because at this point I've, I've been on a health journey for, for, well, let's see, Martha is 18. So that would mean that I've been on this health journey for about 16 years. And so I have to really challenge my body so, to keep going. And so I'm always looking for ways to challenge it and to get, and so, so I work, do, I do lots of different kinds of workouts. And then after that, um, they usually take a shower, have breakfast, and then, and, and as I'm having breakfast is usually when I have my quiet time, uh, right around there, I'll be eating breakfast and I'll have my devotional time. And then after that, I start my day as far as doing the actual work, because up to that point, I haven't really done work necessarily. I've just kind of prepared things, gotten things in place. And from there, I never, I never for sure know how my day is going to go. My day kind of got a little bit interrupted. I actually got off the schedule I just told you about, got a bit interrupted with work today. And that happens. That's part of my, that's, that's part of, part of my job is as executive assistant is being being available at least i make myself available not that i'm forced to um my, my my employers are not cruel about it but i try to be available to them because i know that i have a little more open schedule often than they do especially now that they have a little baby um and so that's basically my morning routine um, and I take breaks throughout the day. I really do. I know sometimes people think that I'm always working. I really do take time where, in fact, there'll be times when I'll, when I'll set, set my phone and iPad aside and computer, and I will just sit and watch, watch TV with my mom. We'll watch an episode of some show that we've been wanting to watch. So I do have downtime. I usually am working however till or, I, I i will often work till 11 o'clock and sometimes midnight which i know sounds really bad but i do but but actually it works with my schedule because i've usually taken a lot of downtime in the evening and then i get my second wind right or right around like nine ten o'clock i'm ready to do a little more work and depending on what i'm working on sometimes i lose track of the time and i've also got college in there too because i because i am take i am going part-time online doing a business marketing degree and I'm loving it. I'm absolutely loving my schooling. And so there are times where my schooling has kept me up into the wee hours of the morning, depending on my schedule. So there you go. <laughs> That's it? That's all you do? Mm -hmm. 
Imagine that. But if anybody else has questions, anything, and, and really, it's open. I mean, if there's a question that you ask that I don't feel comfortable answering, I'll tell you. But I really, I really can't think of anything that I wouldn't want to talk about. Hi, I'm Veronica Robles. From That's Houston. it, Veronica. It's just happy Monday. I just, I just wanted to come on here and say hi to everybody. Um, I, I, you know, I totally understand. I, Ruth, I definitely, I, since being a college student myself, you know, yeah. and being, you know, I, I, am, I've been a student since 2016. Mm -hmm. I entered college at 30 years old. It wasn't easy. I didn't know what I was doing. Mm -hmm. I did not know and now I you know I've been working as a uh, administrative assistant of helping students Ooh. to get them college level ready since 2019 even during this pandemic it, it wasn't easy but you know I I you know for me I get a joy helping students you know to get them ready because when they go to co college classes the professors are very mean <laughs> I can tell you that I've I've seen firsthand I mean tremendously mm -hmm. And I don't, I totally, I totally agree. I'm going to be honest with each and everyone. I don't take a break. You know, I work, um, I work and, you know, I have my classes, you know, I'm taking geography, you know, for me, because, you know, being in special ed classes, you know, since I was in school, I, I didn't, you know, didn't know this stuff. Now that I'm 36 years old, you know, this is all brand new to me. You know, I don't take a lot of breaks, you know, I usually do, like you were saying what, you know, what Kate told you, I think what Kate, right. Is her name Kate? Yeah, her name is Kate. That, uh -huh. Kate, you know, you, you know, you're doing for everybody else, but not for yourself. And I'm gonna be honest, I do that. I okay. do that a lot. Yeah. Yes. I, I get it. I totally get it, Veronica. And um, I would just strongly encourage you to find mm -hmm. something you can do for mm -hmm. yourself because you will burn out. I'm, I mean, oh, I yes. speak from experience and you probably yes. know that feeling. Find something yes. you can do for yourself, whatever that might be, whether it's taking a course, you know, for fun, whether mm -hmm. it's going and, you know, whether it's going to, I mean, I don't know if going to the gym is fun for you or, or, or be. Unfortunately, person. yeah, unfortunately I'm not able to, because, you know, I'm also dealing with my situation. I found out during the pandemic, I have a tumor in my brain, oh, no. a tumor in my brain. And I, unfortunately I've been dealing with with the situation i've seen you know going to four different doctors not being able to figure out how to help me I, over the holidays i found out i had some more spots on my brain and i have F, I, they diagnosed me as epileptic so oh. you know it hasn't been easy but you know i loved helping you know working but you know what you're right i have to do something because i will get burned out and i do yeah. have my moments miss Ruth. Right. Well, um, Veronica, I, I think I remember you mentioning something about your health struggles. I, now that you bring it up, yeah. I think I do remember that. Yeah, you know, I acknowledge you and think I think it's so great that you are continuing to be positive because you, I've known you on Facebook for quite. You you you've been one yes. of my supporters from way back. So I remember. Yes. I remember you, and I mean, you always send me the absolute sweetest and kindest messages. I always yes, tell her, and like, you are so kind. Oh you're God. always so sweet, and you have no idea how much it means to say, "Oh, Veronica just sent me a message," and I always know it's going to be sweet and kind and loving and supportive. And you're so excited. Your enthusiasm always comes through in those messages. And, and you know, you're awesome, Ruth. I mean, you're awesome. I mean, tremendously because. You know, I don't really have a lot of friends who love Hallmark. You know, it's just me and my mom. We love we love the Hallmark channel. You know, we try to find something inspiration because, you know, it's really hard to find things right now. But, you know, it's not very, very good, you know. So we try to find something to keep us, you know, keep us going. You know, even with this pandemic is going on, we try to find something inspiration.
inspirational. Right. You know, like if it's saying the rosary or praying or just watching a good TV show, like When Calls the Heart or old classic episodes of Reva, you know, I'm a huge yeah. Reva McIntyre fan. I love, you know, yeah. love her music very, very much. And, you know, and I totally agree, you know, we have to, you know, things are tough, but we have to keep going. And you're an inspiration to all of us, even to me, Ms. Ruth, because you know what, you, even with everything, you're, you're, you're going forward with your, with your future, your dreams, you know, you keep going no matter what, and you don't let nothing stop you. And just, I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart, because you, you just, you're giving, you, you know, you're just the best and God bless you. And God bless each and every one of you. You know, I'm so glad I'm here tonight to meet each and every one of you. You know, you guys are awesome. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> oh, oh, Veronica, you're so sweet. Thank you so much. Thank I, I, you. My goodness. It, and, and that was really what, what I, I think you put into words what I really want this podcast to be. And this particular yeah. episode especially, I want it to be something that's uplifting and positive and just a chance for us to hang out. I want to build the community. For me, Absolutely. it is about building this wonderful, supportive, kind community. And it's not all about, you know, me be, you know, I, I, I realize it's my podcast, but I also mm -hmm. want it to be a, um, just a community where, where we all feel like, like all of you have a part in that. That's really what I want. Absolutely. And thank you. I just have a quick question before you go back to Paula. Yeah. Um, okay, so you're an excellent writer. We know that. I've seen it. But and you did your blog. But how, like, did you pu where, where did you publish these interviews? Or how did you? You just didn't call Tyler and Paul one day. Like, what? How? How did? <laughs> how did that happen? So, um, the interviews. The way that all came about. So I've been doing the reviews. I was like one of the top tweeters. I mean, I was like tweeting, always doing all the live tweeting with Hallmark. And, I'm, and, and you'd be amazed. I really had to establish myself with some of these actors to really show them that I'm not just here for just Cedar Cove was, was where I made a lot of connections. That was actually the show on Hallmark where I made a whole lot of connections. And I'm still in contact with many of the actors who were on that show. When I would do these reviews, they actually gave me an early, I'd be able to watch it early and I'd be able to do these reviews and I'd tweet it all out. It took a while, but they finally started to realize, oh, you're a really good writer. And, and, and so I made those connections and then I would, then they'd see that I was going to support them um, you know, they were on Hallmark and then maybe they did an episode of this show over here or this they watch, or this movie and they would see that I was supportive. So what happened was um, at that time, I had really, I'd become really good friends with one of the actors in the show, but um, he was the one who I'd always be asking things. He, he, he was a writer or two. And so he'd be looking at my work and we'd have discussions about, okay, is this good? And how should I rewrite this? And so this opportunity came up um, online magazine and I'm still good friends with the editor and um, Starry Mag is actually the name of the magazine. And it's two sisters that, that work as like co-editors on this. And they were looking for writers. And at this point I had never done an interview. I hadn't done anything like that. And I thought, I wonder if I could get on as a writer for them. It wasn't a paid position, but it would just be a way to showcase my work and some more writing. And I remember asking my friend, do you think I could do this? Do you think I, I've never done an interview. I've only been doing those reviews. Do you really think I could do this? I'd like to try it, but I'm not sure. And he's like, well, of course you can. Go right ahead and do it. And I'm like, okay. So I reached out. And they said, oh, yeah, we'd love to have you come on. And I said, I think I'll just write one a month or something like that, <laughs> which that, 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 that I should have known that that's not me. I'm not going to write something once a month. Um, I'm going to do it a lot more often. And so the first, so what happened was then I'd made a lot of these connections on Twitter 
especially. And I reached out to Brennan Elliott, um, who many of you might know from Hallmark, but we've become very close over the years. And so I just reached out and said, Brennan, I, I'm going to start interviewing for this magazine. Would you be interested in doing an interview? And like within 10 minutes, he writes back, well, sure, just get in touch with. And he gave me you know, who I need to get in touch with. And so I reached out to his manager. I mean, I couldn't believe it. I was like, whoa, that was 10 minutes. And he's already saying yes. And so I reached out to his manager. And I thought I was going to have a good week. I thought I would have a good week to get ready for this interview. It was late. No, it was, I had a few days to get ready. And I was, I mean, once I found out I was going to be talking with Brendan Elliott, and it's the first time to actually talk with an actor and all this. And I was real, I was so nervous and I didn't know how this was going to work. I was so afraid I was going to, I was so afraid I was going to mess up. Quite honestly, I was just thinking, I'm going to totally blow this. It's going to be, it, it's going to be terrible, <laughs> all these things, I just, all these things that I was telling myself because I really had no confidence that I could do it. But what was really funny about that first interview is we had, I had nothing but connection issues here. So I had, I love telling the story. So poor Brennan is waiting for like, it was like 30 minutes where we've been trying to connect and I just could not connect. So I left my house. I went to our local gas station where I could get cell reception. <laughs> and my first interview happened in the parking lot of the gas station. I mean, that's honestly where I had my very first interview. And um, so, it, but it went really well. It went and was, it ended up being a good experience. And so from there- Were you pumped, were you pumped to do it, Ruth? What, what was that? <laughs> so were you pumped to do it? Yeah, you know what? I was I was no longer I was no longer nervous. I got your joke. I was no longer nervous. Once I got in the car, you know, it's this weird thing of I've been so nervous. I've been sitting there just like my adrenaline pumping. Once I realized I had to get in the car and drive, I no longer was nervous because then it was like I'm doing something. And so by the time I got there, I wasn't even nervous. It was like, oh, this is easy. You know, I I mean <laughs> interesting how that kind of thing happens your focus uh, shifts and so from so so from there I just started to reach out on Twitter to a lot of these actors actually there's a story of the first time I reached out to Paul my editor beat me to it so my editor got the interview with Paul and I didn't get the interview with Paul and I was so bummed about it I remember because I thought oh I just watched him in in this movie and I, and, you know, like Christmas detour. And I really wanted to interview him. That's not, Oh, you know, Oh, I really wanted to interview him. And I know he's got another, and anything for love was coming up and I, and I wanted to interview him and my editor got it. It's like, and so, so I worked with, so for a while I was writing for this magazine. The thing was when you have an editor, your, the editor has their way that they want it written. And then I was very, I had my way of writing and lots of times they had to do so much work to edit it to the way they wanted it written. And so we had, we, I, I talked back and forth with my editor and I said, you know what? I love work. I love writing for you guys, but I think maybe it's time for me to go out on my own. And so we parted ways very amicably. I mean, there was no bad blood. I mean, we're still very supportive of each other. Um, but it just seemed like the right time. And I thought, I've got this blog. Why don't I switch over and have my interviews on my blog? It makes, it makes more sense because then I have complete control over the way that I can write them. And that's what I did. And so from there, it just really blew up once people realized that, that I was now writing these interviews, doing them. And so when I, when I, con when I would contact the various actors, um, and I still do this to this day, I was even doing it now that I'm back to finding people to interview. Um, I do have access to, um, there's something called the internet movie database and you can get a pro account. And so I do have access to that. And when you have that, you do have some access to agents and 
more information than if you're ju you just go to the Internet Movie Database as a quote unquote, you know, just like the, it, it's just a free account. You don't have access to all of the emails and websites that you might when you're a pro, when you have a pro account. So I do have that. But I also reach out on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. And I and actually, if you look, if you look through the people who have joined our Facebook group, you might find that a lot of those people are actors or they are involved in the film industry because they're, I've, I've been able to develop friendships over the years with a lot of these people and a lot, and I've invited them a lot of, a lot of them to join the group. And so a lot of them have. And so that is how I ended up being able to do these interviews. It's, it's, and, and it's really fascinating now. Um, I will literally spend my time just, I'll, I'll say, okay, I'm going to take about 30 minutes and I'm going to look through my Twitter or my Instagram and just see who's posting things. And cause, cause I follow a lot of people that sometimes I don't even know how I started following them, but I'll just see what people are tweeting about uh, in the film industry or authors or just in general. And sometimes someone will pop up. And, and so it's, it's, it's really, it's, it's fascinating how it happens, but I think that nowadays people in any industry, I mean, just because of the way marketing has changed, they realize the value of being able to come on and be interviewed by somebody who either writes well, or in this case, now I have a podcast, and they know that that's the way to get the word out, and it's up to that individual person to really do their own marketing, and so I think that's part of the reason, and then I have, I've, I've worked very hard to build that reputation that people know that I'm going to be doing, doing, doing a good, doing a good job. I'm going to be um, very positive. Yes, Paula, go for it. Okay, from two years ago. Yeah. What would you say is your biggest obstacle you had to overcome to achieve what you achieved? My biggest obstacle it was perfectionism. That is, <laughs> that is what has held me back because throughout my life, I believed that I was a perfectionist. I lived as a perfectionist. Now, it did not always extend to everybody else. In fact, lots of times I was willing to forgive people over and over again. Sometimes, to the, sometimes I would give people so many chances to, that, that I would just kind of let them walk all over me and and forgive them when and and let them hurt me again so many times even though I should have known better um so when it came to other people I didn't hold them to that standard but with me it was all about perfectionism because I wanted to be perceived as being the one that had it all together I'm I'm doing everything correctly I would be such a perfectionist I'd be doing everything right. I mean, I would be working and maybe there'd be all these projects that we're working on. And I could literally, out of a hundred things that I'm doing, I could do 99 of them right. But that one thing that I did wrong, I would blow that up to be the biggest thing. And it would just negate those other 99 things I did right. That was where, and that was where my focus was. Oh my goodness. And I, I didn't do that right. And it was usually a really tiny thing. It wasn't even usually something big. It was just a little tiny thing that just seemed to be adjusted. But I thought, oh, I did that wrong. And I messed up. And I it just and, and that was the way I had lived my life. I could do everything doing I'm doing it so well. I'm doing this really well. But oh, there I messed up. So now I'm no good. And so what do you tell yourself now in that moment? What do you tell yourself now in that moment? In that moment, um, trying to think how, how I've, still there are those moments that come up where the old, those old thoughts will try to come back and say, oh, look, Ruth, you're no good. Look what you're doing here. But now I say, um, I think, well, actually, one of the things that I still saw myself saying quite a bit is, I am whole, perfect, and complete. 
And I go back to that. I can't tell you how many times I will say that when there is nothing else. I mean, I do turn to scripture. That is true. Um, if I'm really struggling with, with things, um, but I, I realize that my worth is no longer tied to what I'm doing. I used to really be focused on, and that, that's where all that perfectionism would come in. I'd say, okay, if I can't do everything perfectly, I'm no good. But now I have been able to shift that thinking. And I realize that if I, if I mess up, it's okay, because I'm going to learn from that. And I found myself saying, I'm glad I made this mistake because I've made this mistake and I learned from it. And I have found that to be the case on so many things. I mean, I go back to some of those really difficult moments where those challenging moments where nothing seemed to be going right. I was just doing, and, and I really wanted to beat myself up, but I'd say, no, what can I learn from this situation? I'll take a deep breath acknowledge the emotions if they come acknowledge those thoughts if they come but don't stay there and what can i learn from this and that has been something that it, that has helped me quite a bit and i just and then i go back to i am whole perfect and complete and it's not about what i'm doing it's about who i am good Very question awesome. paula all right so, uh paula cooley did you want to i know you probably yeah. had another question I I have another one. Um, have you ever, or would you want to be in the movies as an extra or as whatever? Have you ever had that opportunity? Well, that's another interesting question. Um, I would say there there was a period of time when I, was, when I was growing up, I really did want to be, I actually had the dream of going to Broadway. I actually wanted to be in Broadway musicals and then it didn't work out. And actually was grateful it didn't uh, because it just, I don't think that that kind of life, that that's a, that's a very hard life. Broadway's tough. Broadway is very, very competitive. But uh, I would have said many years ago, absolutely not. I'd never want to be involved in, I always want to be behind the scene. Um, and, and I remember going to, um, one of the when calls the heart conventions, and if you guys know who peter de is he's one of the directors um that he does a lot with when calls the heart and other hallmark movies and and his wife Anne marie de louise she's also been in some of the movies as well um she was in, she was she actually had a pretty pivotal role in when calls the heart um if you if you guys have ever seen um there's what there's there's I don't remember what season it is, but it's when the when the two kids that Lori Lachlan's character is trying to adopt and that lady comes and tries to take them. Um, and then she finally and she so she was kind of like the mean lady trying to come and take the girl take the two kids away. And then she finally said, Okay, they can stay. That's actually Anne Marie de Louise, who is married to Peter de Louise, and Peter de Louise is a director who he doesn't usually sometimes he, he'll appear in the movies, but he's a director. Anyway, he is quite a flamboyant character. He's loads of fun. Um, and I went um, during one of these conventions. Um, he was our tour guide for this group. Um, for because because you go up and you tour where where when calls the heart is filmed, and so what he would do is he was bringing people up to reenact, like like to reenact certain parts and we'd give them a scene. And I was literally hiding out in the back. And this, and actually this video is on my YouTube. If you search, if you go through my videos, you'll actually see there's a video because I did post it on my YouTube. Um, so I was literally staying in the back. Like I don't ever, because he's asking for volunteers. I'm like, I don't want any, I don't want to do this. I don't want anything whatsoever to do with this. And so I remember I'm standing there in the back, hiding out, and he's looking for volunteers and nobody volunteers. And he picked me and I was like, really? I don't want to do this. I don't want to be the one up there doing that. <laughs> so I remember he brings me up and somebody was filming it for me because and and I just and, and then my first thought is oh good grief now I'm gonna have to share this video with all of my actor friends 
everybody's going to see this and I don't want to do this, but I was going to save face and do it. And, and I wasn't really that good. I, I, I got better, but, but it was, and I remember it was, I was so nervous while I was doing it, so self-conscious. But then I watch it back and it's actually kind of a really good memory. I'm glad that I went ahead and did it. And I'm glad that he forced me to do it. Um, you were a very good cook. You were a very good cook. <laughs> So you guys, it is harder than it looks because the problem is that my biggest problem was I would look at him at the end of the scene and you can't do that because I'm so used to doing that. Like, did I do that? Okay. Was that okay? <laughs> but, um, that season one is over. Okay. I can <laughs> that, that is the entire life. Season I, one that season one is over. Right, right. Okay. And, and I supposed to do any other action besides that? So you're you're right to ask me. That. I thought. Right. So I as as a director, I expect to do that. Right. Okay. But but if you need direction, I will help you. Yeah. I want you to turn from the stove from having been cooking, and turn and look at the other actor and say, I can cook now. That season one is over. Okay, so Action. I can cook now that season one is over. And cut. So we need quiet. We're rolling. Shh. Okay. So don't look at me. I'm not here. Right. Just stay right. in the scene right. until okay. I yell cut. Okay. And yeah. also, it seemed like you would totally burn your hand. If yeah. Right. Right. So we yeah. Here we go. So you've got the cloth, and you're cooking. And and you turn and give the line. Here we go. And then stay in the scene until I yell cut. Okay. Here we go. And hashtag Hardee's. Take two. And action. I can cook now that season one is over. And cut. So you looked at me too early. I, really <laughs> I know you want my approval. You can have it unconditionally. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. 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 like I can turn around so I'm no, not no, no, it, no. but okay. I won't know if you did it right or not. Right. right. Okay. Right. Right. So okay. just okay. concentrate okay. on the other actor okay. and stay in the scene until I okay. Here we go. Okay. And hashtag parties. Take three. Action. I can cook now that season one is over. Good for you. And, and smile. <laughs> and go back to cooking. And cut. I'll cut. I'll cut that awkward pause out. That'll be great. Okay. And give it up for it. <laughs> so I'm not saying that I absolutely would have. To, I I, would, I really don't want to be be a lead or anything like that but if the opportunity ever presents itself that i could be yeah. an extra or just come on i mean i i want to personally i just want to go to set and hang out and i don't even have to be on you know in something if, but if they get but if they said you want to come on um i i certainly wouldn't be opposed to that i but that was but a, but a couple of years ago i would have said absolutely not <laughs> so i get your first i I get your first signed headshot. Okay. I don't, I'm not looking at being, being a movie actress where that becomes my career. I would actually like to, I do have some ideas to do some script writing that I would love to write these scripts and make, and, and hopefully sell them to somebody to make the movie. I would love to do that. So we'll see. I have not taken the time to really pursue that too much, but I believe I will. I believe I will at what it just is, it just is, what is it's the right time? And I have a feeling that once I start on those, it won't take me that long because I've been thinking about these ideas. I've planned them out for years, some of these script ideas. You, you also mentioned before that you taught art. Okay. Um, how long did you teach art? It was it close to where you are now or where was it when you were teaching? And do you still work with the arts? Do you paint or do you draw or is it just the singing arts or just? That's, yeah, that's good. Um, so 
music was the main was was really what I taught. But what, what was really weird that happened with art because there, there was a there was a weird period of time where I did teach art. I taught elementary art, and what I remember about that is is it was, it was a it was a Christian school. And I remember my, I remember I was on vacation. I was actually like in the middle of central Texas, we were on vacation and I get this call from my principal and she says, well, would you be willing to teach art, elementary art? And I'm like, no, I can't do, I can't do anything with art. I can't, I can't do art. And so I got off the phone with her and I, and I just told my mom, I can't do this. You know, we're having this big family vacation. I can't, I can't teach art. My mom's like, sure you could. You've done crafts and stuff. Cause I, cause I've done crafts, but I hadn't really done drawing, a lot of drawing or anything. In fact, in fact, I had had teachers when I was growing up, teach, no matter what I did, I was never good enough when it came to drawing. So I just gave up. Um, so, but I talked to my mom for a while and she said, you know, call her back and say, you can do it. You really should. And I'm like, okay. And so I remember calling my principal back and saying, you know, I don't know what, I don't know much about art, but sure. If you need me to teach art, I'll teach art. And so of course, being who I am, I then spent the time getting books and researching and seeing how I could do this. And once I got into teaching elementary art, I really enjoyed it. It was so fun how the kids would think I was such a good artist. And I'd be thinking, <laughs> well, <laughs> probably, you know, I, I probably not, I'm probably not the very best artist, but, but okay, that's, that, that's nice. And I, and I really enjoyed it because we did a lot of fun things. We didn't just do drawing, uh, but we would do things like uh, one of the most fun things I ever did in the art class <laughs> was, Michelangelo, if you know the story of Michelangelo, uh, when he was doing, when he was paying the Sistine Chapel, he basically did it lying on his back, and he would. And so it was a. So what I did, I remember having this room, this classroom of first graders, and I said, okay, we've now taped pieces of paper, these big pieces of paper, underneath the the table, so you all are going to get on the floor with your crayons markers, whatever, and you're going to draw. And we had so much fun. It was so much fun to see these kids because they were getting the idea of this is what Michelangelo had to do. And that's what I would do is because of my love for history, I would take an artist from history and we would do some, and I, would, and I had these books that would help us where, okay, you learn about the artist and then you try to do something that's like what that artist would do. And so because so that was, that was the way that I taught art. And I really enjoyed it. Um, mu music was the main thing that I taught. Um, and, and I really enjoyed it. What I will say at this point is it's not something I would go back into the classroom right now. And the reason that I, that I don't see myself going back to the classroom is I just don't, I don't quite have the passion that I see that I see that I think that teachers really have to have for there's a lot of things when you're teaching the arts there's a lot of stuff that comes up it is it is deceptive you think it's a really easy thing I, that all I did is we just sang all the time that when I would teach music that's all we did and there and nothing could be further from the truth and so it requires something that that I've seen in other music teachers in fact I, I think one of the biggest eye-opening experiences for me was when Martha was in school Martha's my daughter and she had her she had this art there's uh, not art teacher it's music teacher who was so filled with passion and I watched this lady the way that she would interact with the kids in fact I subbed for her uh when she was on maternity leave and there was just something about the way this particular teacher, I just saw this passion in her that I didn't quite have. I love the performance stuff and I love, we were always doing programs. We were always doing performances. And that was the stuff that I loved. But when it came to actually teaching them, I sometimes didn't have quite the patience 
and quite the the drive that I see in teachers. And actually, when Mar Martha is going to, to studying art education now, and she took a course her senior year where it was a practicum where they're actually going into the classroom. When I saw the report back from her first time teaching the kids, I said, Martha, you have what I didn't have. It's like one of those, I can't quite put it into words, but there's something that, that I believe you have to have this certain, there's something that teachers have to have in order to be in the classroom and really make a difference. And not that I didn't, and I, and I loved teaching. I honestly loved it. And I'm glad that I did it. I learned so much and I still use so many of those skills, but I just, I got burned out because it just was not what I was supposed to do for my whole life. I love the idea of laying on the floor painting. I think we need to challenge everybody here to try it. Oh, it's a <laughs> it's my next fun. Day, my next night with Frank, we're going to lie under the dining room table. There you go. Was, I, I want to see your drawing. I think was, it would be great. It was so yeah. much fun. I even got yeah. down and did it with the kids. And we really had yeah. fun. It's something you really get an appreciation yeah. for what Michelangelo did. And, and it's fun. I mean, it's totally out of the box. And that was just an idea. It wasn't something that I came up with. It was just, you know, because I'm, I'm forever, when it comes to coming up with activities, I'm forever looking for ideas. And it was just somebody had that idea and I took it and I ran with it and the kids loved it. They was, they, they actually, oh. they, they didn't want to give, they didn't want to stop doing it. And it was one of the, the things that I think a lot of them would remember to see all these first graders under the table and then and, you know then their teacher comes back and what are they doing oh yeah we're we're, we're drawing you know, just under the table and and it was fun though we had a blast <laughs> well you, you live out on the farm and I'm always fascinated mm -hmm. when you when you're doing your outdoor videos I mean I'm just fascinated at your goats in the background <laughs> <laughs> whose idea were goats and do you milk them are they milking goats okay so the the goats I mean I know it was pro it was probably possibly my mom's idea or talking with other people in the area um originally we had four regular sized goats and and I and I don't remember their names now my mom might, because she loved uh, those four goats. Were that they were very, very special to her. We got the goats originally to keep the grass in the field down because regular mm -hmm. sized goats would, and, and they did a pretty good job of it. Um, mm -hmm. And we didn't milk the ones that we got. We didn't milk them because um, if you choose to milk goats you have to keep up with it. Like it is, yeah. it's, it's one of those things you can't just say, well, I'm going to milk the goats this week and I'm not going to milk them next week. It doesn't work like that. I mean, it's, it's a very, it's a very time consuming thing. So these goats, we just, they, they, they were not ever intended for milking. Okay. And we learned a lot with those four goats. In fact, my mom and I learned to, one of the goats broke their legs and we could not get a vet out to fix it. So my mom and I had to set the, had to set the goat's leg and we uh -huh. did it. <laughs> we did it. We, we got all this advice about how to do it. And honestly, you would never have known, um, you know, a few months later, you never would have known that this goat's leg had ever been broken. I mean, it might've looked a little bit cockeyed, but, but for the most part, you just wouldn't have noticed. Um, we had to get rid of those four goats. Um, we sold them because they started jumping the fence and there was nothing. I mean, we, we were running into this. It became a danger for them because they jumped the fence and then there's a, there's a street out there and we don't want them to get hit by a car or <laughs> anything like that. And so no matter what we did, I mean, I did loads of research to try to figure out how do we maintain these goats and keep them from jumping the fence. And there was just nothing we could do. And so then we decided, my mom decided, especially she's like, well, we want goats, but let's get little ones. And so she did some research, found there were two little goats that um, had just been born and we were able to go and 
pick them up and um because we and they were they became they're more they don't really do a lot to keep the grass down but they're more companions than they're kind of just fun to have <laughs> so yeah. i don't know if they necessarily serve a purpose right now but they're just fun to to have and it's and, and really it was fun when they were little um well they used to they used to crawl under the fence <laughs> until they got big enough and they couldn't do it anymore oh. <laughs> it was really something uh, when we had to go and get them uh get them fixed uh, the, so that they would not mate um man it was something coming back because if the brother and sister and you know the sister she was fine that the brother all the way back in the car he's crying like crazy even though he's not oh. in pain he's just crying which which <laughs> like his manhood's been taken and he's crying and you can just tell I'm, I'm up in the front with his sister and she is just like rolling her eyes almost like what is my brother doing mm. yeah, he's fine like he's fine he doesn't he's making all this she like first of all she was she was a little bit concerned and then she's like no he's fine he's fine he's just being he's just I mean and and they and the people that we bought the ghost room said that that would happen that the the that the male goats when they when they get I, I don't I don't know whatever they call it I, I don't know if they're called neutered when they're goats I think they're called something else I don't remember but anyway um um when that happens they do make a big deal of it they make a big spectacle of it because they want they, they're not in pain they just want to they they want everybody to know that this has happened to them I guess, I guess. <laughs> Um, so, so yeah so our goats are mainly now just here that they're just they're just here for fun and in, in many ways for entertainment yeah for entertainment yeah, yeah. And the last question for me is is i you i hear your mom talk about you know the that you live in a little uh, city or town yeah uh do you fight who has to go in for a quart of milk when you run out <laughs> um, you have to drive to get to we, we only have a 15 minute drive thankfully oh um, okay in town. Not bad. Yeah, in town 15 20 minutes 15 to 20 minutes it's not that bad but still we don't like we don't like to have to go in unless we i mean we prefer we still want to plan it for when we have to yeah. go in um so usually usually if we run out of something like that we just make do until because we kind of try to plan when we're going into town yeah, because we yeah. I realize it's only 15 to 20 minutes. But still, if you think about it, if you just imagine 20 minutes into town, give or take. And then maybe you're an hour at the store and then another 20 minutes home. Well, then you're looking at, you know, you've been gone like two out, you know, you've gone to, you've been out two hours. And and so it's not that that's horrible, but it's just you want to plan ahead just so that we're not having to to make trips daily we would rather not it's it's kind of nice to be out here and be kind of self-sufficient and not have to go into town for everything and and that's and i mean i it used to be of course when i was subbing i was going into town every day but i will admit it's been very nice um not yeah. to have to go into town every day and 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 now if we want, if we need to go to the city for something, as in, let's say it's a bigger trip, that's more like 35 to 40 minutes. We definitely plan those. But to just yeah. go, uh, I mean, I mean, yeah, we live in a smaller place. It's true, but it has grown up so much that um, it has expanded quite a bit, even in the time that we've been here. Yeah. Well, I thank you very much for letting me and ladies for letting me ask the oh, questions. No, that was great. That was kind of what I was great questions. For. Yeah. Okay, Veronica, I know you wanted to say something. You wanted to say something or ask a question? I, I, oh, I was, I mean, I was trying to come up with a good question to ask Ms. Ruth, but my question is, um, if who, if, if, okay, just say if Hollywood wanted to make a movie about your life, who yeah. would you want to play you? Ooh, wow. Oh, Veronica, that is such a good question. Oh my yes. goodness. I don't think I've ever been asked that. I've been asked 
what what network my my live story would be on and i've and i always said lifetime because i don't think it's hallmark friendly but <laughs> my life, my life. <laughs> okay. but um oh to play me my goodness um mm, wow i'm trying to think of who even looks who i mean i guess i guess it's not always about who looks like me um i'm trying to think through um rachel cook oh she would be fun i was thinking i was yeah she would be fun i was thinking allison mm -hmm. would be fun yes that would be that would be great that would <laughs> but yeah be rachel awesome. lee cook oh i love rachel lee cook too i mean yeah i mean yes and too yeah uh but no i was just trying to think of um I don't know. It, it, it might be it, it might be kind of cool. Um, I wouldn't mind having Candace Cambray play me. That'd be kind of cool. Yeah, be kind of cool. Um, yeah that would be awesome. That would be awesome. Yeah, I mean, um, you, have, you have nothing else to do, Ruth. You can have a new career. You can play yourself. That well, yeah. that's true. That's I mean, true. Here's, here's I would. I would, would be. be yeah. That would be kind of interesting. If, I know. If, I, if I you, use, you could be. Yeah. You could actually, in real life be one of the female characters in any of the Hallmark movies you've watched. Yeah. And date date one of those men in one of those movies <laughs> and be that character. Who would it be? What movie? I wonder who that would be. Eh? Who would you want to be? Yeah. Not, not actor, character. Yeah, no, no, I know. I'm trying to, I'm actually trying to think through here. Um, Carson oh. Shepard? Um, you, you know, because the other person I didn't think about was Cindy Busby. I I I, I love. Yeah. Her too. I'm trying. Yeah. I'm, you know, I think I know. I know. I know who I would probably pick. Um. I think maybe uh, the Unleashing Mr. Darcy series. Um, yeah. I'd love to play Elizabeth Bennett. I think that would be <gasps> really, that would be awesome. awesome. Because then, yeah. who, 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 who the did she get? Ryan Pavey. No, but this is about the guy. Which guy do you want to date? Yes. Which one do you, you want to date? Work? Which character? Which well, character would you have wanted to date? Um, Carson Shepard? No. Like in real, like really, real, like a man no. that. No, I wouldn't want no, Carson, Carson Shepard. I'm sorry, guys. Carson Shepard, his, his character is so. He's, he's like, oh, well, of course, now he's in Baltimore, so it might be different. But in Hope Valley, he didn't get to do very much. He was, he was like, always yeah. in the infirmary. Um, yeah. If we're talking about, um, hey, I say Bill Avery. Bill Avery. Yeah. Yes. 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 I could date Bill Avery. I could date Bill Avery. I don't want to date Jack because Jack's dead. So. There's not a point. Yeah. <laughs> not a point. Um, but but uh, has there been a movie like a movie that you really like um, the character? Yeah, you know there actually is. Um, I would say that still one of my all-time favorite Hallmark movies is mm -hmm. um, uh, Pr uh, Princess for Christmas. Um, that that movie, Michael Damien's movie. Um, where yeah. I would love, uh, now that guy has gone to Outlander and he's the lead in Outlander now, but man, yes. I, I, yeah, I love the Royal movies. And so mm -hmm. if we're going to pick one, it needs to be somebody, I mean, I'm, I'm like, give me a guy. Yeah, why not pick a prince? Come on. If you can date one, and pick a prince. Yeah, print. why not? That's what I'd say. Uh, give me a guy that's got a really great English accent, you know, really nice <laughs> yeah. accent and um yeah i I'd, I'd, I'd be all i'd be all for that definitely definitely <laughs> well yeah. well whoever whoever <laughs> plays you they're gonna have to do justice because Ruth, my friend you are awesome that's all i can say well, each of you guys are awesome seriously well thank you thank you veronica i appreciate that oh of course now now andrew walker's got some pretty good characters yes paul green has some good characters too i realize that um Actually, what was it? I was just watching Campfire Kiss uh, yesterday and remembering, and I, I, I had to force myself to turn that off because I was like, 
oh man, that was such a good, I was watching it, like, oh, that was such a good movie. But why didn't they let him sing in that movie? Why didn't he get to sing Written in the Stars? He wrote Written in the Stars. Anyway, so that's what I remember. And he was a little bit arrogant. (laughs) He was a little bit high on himself in that movie. Well, yeah, yeah. The character was. Yeah, the character was, yeah. Yeah. Um, and well, my favorite wedding. He was a little bit arrogant too in that one too. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. Um. So, so I mean, there's 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 a lot. Yeah, there's there's a lot of characters. Um. You know, I, I'm waiting for Giles Patton to have his first official Hallmark lead because they haven't let him do. Um, an official Hallmark lead. He's made. He's actually done a couple leads that have, that, that people have gotten to see in Canada, but not here. Mm-hmm. And so we're waiting mm-hmm. because he usually plays the he, he, Giles Patton. Um, you might know him from It Was Always You. He play at, which that's Tyler Hines and um, Aaron Krakow, and he plays the other guy. He plays the dentist in that one. That's Giles Patton. Oh, okay. he's, a, he's a really good yeah. friend of mine. Um, and he, I, we're still waiting for that official Hallmark lead. Hasn't quite yes. gotten there. And, um, cause I, cause he's, yeah, he's, he's a pretty amazing guy. He's, 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 I've known him for, I've known him longer than I've known Paul. So, so, he, so, and he's, and I've he's, seen him a lot of, yeah. 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 There's a lot I of see, yeah. I've seen him in a lot of movies. I mean, he hasn't got the lead. I hope, I hope right. that he gets. Uh, um, I mean, seriously, the one with Leanne Ryan when he started with, I think, was he with Tyler Ryan's and Leanne Ryan's? Is that movie? I looked at uh, yes, he movies. was in that one also. And in that one, he played he had a smaller role. He was a yeah. father. He was he was he was married and had kids in that one. So that was mm-hmm. that was that was that that yeah, there was that one. But yeah. All right. Well, does anybody have I, any other I got a question. Yeah, go for it. Have you ever been disappointed when you're interviewing an actor and actress because you associate them with the character and you kind of think their personality should be like that? Yep. You know what? Ooh, that's a good um, now, I, I don't know if I've been disappointed on the on the positive, I mean, as far as the positive side, I've actually been usually much more, like, really impressed, but when I first started following all these actors, um, I used to associate them so much with the character. In fact, that's why I wanted nothing to do with Brendan Elliott when I first saw him, because he was playing a really negative character in Cedar Cove. <laughs> he was playing Warren Saget, well, not for sure, but Warren. Um, it was not a nice character and um i was actually i remember that i didn't i didn't want anything to do with it because i thought you're just like your character you must be just like your character um because warren's mean so you must be mean and i didn't want anything to do with him and i realized that i tended to and some fans do this they tend to associate the character so much with that person that they don't, they think, well, that person's mean, or that person's this, or that, that person's that, yeah, I miss Cedar Cove too, yeah, definitely, um, and so that's something that I learned, have, have I, I don't think I've ever been disappointed, however, in fact, actually, I've sometimes been pleasantly surprised, where I thought this actor was going to be really arrogant, or not as nice, um, I wasn't sure when, when I first met Jesse Medcalf this summer, I wasn't sure if I was going, I wasn't sure how that was going to, how our conversation was going to go. And I was so totally impressed with him that suddenly he moved, he moved way up on, I thought, I thought, you know, he's a pretty good guy. He's not just a talented, but he's a pretty good guy. And sometimes, sometimes people don't come across on social media the same way they are in real life and mm-hmm. so it's always important to not to to really get to know the person not just automatically assume that this is how they are because I saw them in this movie and they're like this and because not everybody is always like how they appear so I can't say I've been not everybody's perfect 
And sometimes I've been surprised. That's a good question, though. A really good question. All right. I have a question. I have a question. Yeah. And I, I'll have real, actually, I have two questions now. Okay. Okay. Um, Michael Rady's always been a real, uh, I've always really liked Michael Rady. Yeah. Uh, he comes across as a, uh, I don't, when, and, and when he's in a movie or something, he's, he has emotions right here on his shoulders. You know, he, I, I like to see someone who's acting, who looks like they're, I guess, laughing through tears. Is that what you call it? Yeah. You know, he always has that kind of, uh, and I love to watch him act. Did, did you interview him? And does yeah. he have that? Same, what, what was his personality like? I mean, uh, is he, is he in, come across that way? Oh yeah. You know, I was so impressed. I, that was an interview that I landed right when the pandemic happened and he was getting ready to have a movie with Kim and um, Nat, Natalie, I can't remember her name. Um, I should know it because I interviewed her too. Um, but there was a movie where they were both, um, they had, they had food trucks. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, his manager. You're making me crazy. It's a movie. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's what, yes. And so I got to talk with him, which, which really amazed me. And when I talked with him, I was just so thoroughly impressed. I mean, I could not get over, um, he and Paul have a lot in common because really yeah michael they, they i mean they live they have they have they really have created their own little oasis with him and his family he doesn't really interact a lot on social media he kind of stays away from that but they were when the pandemic hit they were fine because they have they do all their own gardening and they basically live that everything's forested they live in their own little oasis and i love that and he was just the nicest guy. I mean, just so authentic. I remember at one point, one of his kids interrupted the conversation and he's like, I'm on the phone right now, or, you know, I'm, I'm doing an interview right now. And, and it was just so, so yeah, exactly. I, I can verify that what you see from Michael Rady, that's who he is. I mean, he's just, he's just fabulous. And um, I, I know he doesn't do a lot of interviews, but I was very honored that he was willing to do this interview with me. And yeah, I, I, I remember it was it. one of those times I reached out and did not know what would happen because I, because I'm thinking uh, he's a big time star and there's not really a lot of, he doesn't have a lot of social media presence. So I don't know. And like his manager or agent or somebody set it up and I was like, okay, here we go. Yeah. I was hoping to see that he would go to Roma drama or Christmas town or something. They never have him there. Well, he's and it, he pro he probably is. It's pro I, I know sometimes actors don't don't think about going to those kinds of things. That's not it, we we so often think that actors are the are all of them are these super outgoing people and they love to be around people. And most of them, most of them prefer keeping to themselves, and they don't really want they, they they're they're often very reserved. I mean, they can play all those great characters and they're very creative and, the, and all that, but not, but a lot of them are not outgoing. So um, it's, it's one of the, they're not all extroverts. We get, we get, we get spoiled because you have people like Paul and people like Tyler who are very extra, who appear, you know, very extroverted and all that, but not all actors, most actors actually aren't like that. And so some of them, it's really hard for them to think about going to a convention like that. Um, I'm thinking maybe when his kids get a little bit older, because he, because his kids are still rather small. I mean, I, it's been a few years. You know, um, you know Eric maybe is out, out, didn't do a lot with social media. And as his kids have gotten older, you know, I, I mean, I was, I, I was very surprised to see him go to a fan convention. It was like, oh, He's at, he's at a fan convention and, and, you know, then he's got another one coming up and, and that. So I, so I think that with some of them, it just re takes when it's the right time and they kind of have to step out of their comfort zone to do it. So, so you just never know. Um, I would like, I think it'd be really cool because I think that he really enjoyed Like Wes Brown is somebody when I first, his first fan convention was in Nashville. Who he was in Nashville 
when I saw him, um, because he was, he was at Christmas Con, wasn't he? I believe he was. I think he was at both of them. Yeah, yeah, he was. That's what I thought. Yeah. Well, who, who I saw him at Christmas Con, he was so much more comfortable. I (laughs) saw him at Roma Drama, and at first, he was kind of like, you could tell, he didn't really know this is new for him. And as he did, so I think a lot of them, it just requires that stepping out of their comfort zone. And once they step out of their comfort zone and try it, they're like, oh, this isn't that bad. This is really cool. Then they start connecting with the fans and it, and it becomes more comfortable. Okay. Yeah. Okay. My second, well, my second question is, uh, I know you've done a lot of interviews and you have a lot of them coming up and I'm not really sure how you choose who you do, but is there anybody and I guess there's always someone on the horizon and things are always going forward. But if the, is there anyone right now that you think you would you would like to do uh, to do an interview with or a podcast with? And and it would just be the icing on the cake for you that you say, OK, this yeah. this is and now I've done it. Yeah. Is there anyone any one person like that? Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I was talking with my, my friend the other day. And saying how I have I have these really big dreams for where this podcast will end up someday, and I I told her you know I have in my mind that one day don't know exactly when but one day in the future I want to be able to interview a A list actors not not and not because I have to not because of how great I am but it's like I really want it to expand where I can basically interview anyone that I want to. I mean, that's what, that's what I, what my, what my hope would be. And when I was talking along with her, all of a sudden it just like flipped out and I, and I, and I thought about it later. So, so somebody who I'd really would enjoy interviewing would be Hugh Jackman. Oh, <laughs> I would really, yeah, this is a great interview. And, I like and, and, and the reason is that you think of how, Again, it goes back to those musical theater roots that I have, but then he's done all these other things too. And he's always seems like such a really nice guy. I mean, I mean, I'd be willing to interview anyone. I mean, when it comes down to it, but for some reason, I just said that I was, it's like, I'm talking to him. I'm like, yeah, I'd like to interview Hugh Jackman. And I'm like, oh, where did that come from? And it's like, I wasn't even thinking about it. And since I said that, I'm like, yeah, you know, i I'd put that on my bucket list. Yeah, that'd be that'd be kind of cool to to be able to bring him on and 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 not just because he's a quote unquote a list actor, but because of all the things that he's done. I mean, he's so talented, yeah. does so many things. Yeah. You know, people have seen him. What I've never seen him. It was he played like the Wolverine or something like that. Something like that. I've not seen him in that. Yeah. But like his musical stuff, his other stuff. It's like it's like it's, there's always. And, just, and then when I see him interviewed, he just always seems like this really nice, humble guy. Um, yeah, uh, that, so that's on my bucket list. But honestly, there I'm willing to interview. I think it'd be fun to bring anybody on. I don't know why. I, nef- I, I think I was going to say I don't know why I stuck on him, but I think I actually do just because it's so very and it just would be somebody completely different than anyone I've ever interviewed because I just haven't, I, the, the biggest name to this point that I've interviewed would be Candace Cambure. I think she's the biggest name probably. Um, I mean, I did interview Lacey Chabert as well, but that was, and I, and I interviewed Danica McKellar, but Candace Cambure actually spoke with her. So that was kind of like the, the other two we did through email. And so those are the biggest names that I've interviewed, but I think it'd be really cool, nice to be able to, say I would like to be able to bring them on and for it to be something very different you know and not not just the typical Hollywood interview but something fun and I think it'd be great for the fans I think it'd be I think it'd be you can imagine what the virtual audience would be like if I had somebody like that oh yeah (laughs) <laughs> exactly all right well you guys have been absolutely fantastic i've loved it. and this is this was my hope you guys asked some really great questions and you guys made it lots of fun that was what i wanted and the biggest thing that i have learned from doing these podcasts is i used to be very structured when i would do these interviews i was very structured and you know i, I knew where we were going i did all my research and i'm finding now 
that I'm just like, don't even have much of a plan. I just kind of, I have a, I, I've done a little bit of research, but I really want it to be something that we have a, such a genuine conversation that it's not all planned out. That, and it's, it's out of my comfort zone. Yeah, it, it's fun. And that's really what I want for all of you. I want it to be something fun. That's why I agreed to do this particular episode. I'm not usually the one who's on stage being interviewed, but I love the fact that people came out with wonderful questions, and it was had such a blast that I do plan to do these quarterly, as long as my schedule allows. Your support has been amazing. This podcast has become something I never would have dreamed, so thank you so much. Please subscribe. Please rate and review me I would, on Apple Podcasts. I'd love that. And I look forward to seeing you all again. Have a great day.